Today, we are going to work on whatever is in this little box. This was sent to me by a viewer, and thank you so much. I know what is inside, but I haven't unpacked it yet. I think I have this small box since four months now. I don't know, I would have to check. But enough talking, let's just see what's inside and what we have to do today. So, let's see. Okay. So far, oh, hmm, P Pro, Pentium Pro 200, one megabyte cache, bad pins. So this CPU is suffering from bent pins and I made a video about a socket 8 board that I fixed recently with a few Pentium Pro CPUs, but I never had a one megabyte Pentium Pro CPU. So let's see how bad the pins actually are. And then you can watch me straightening all these pins under the microscope. So. nicely packed there's an anti-static bag in there okay multiple layers ah, okay so here we can already see the CPU and here it is a black top intel pentium pro with a sticker pins quite bad so let's see we're looking at this together at the very first time i have no idea how this will look like um okay that doesn't look bad at all I think. I mean, I have worked on pins that were a lot worse, but I think the problem is not necessarily how bad the pins are bent, but also how they are connected to the CPU here. And now when I turn it a little bit, I can see that there are a few pins missing. So there is one missing here in this corner and also right in the opposite corner. It's interesting that there is a looks like it's just a hole where the pin is supposed to be but yeah so these two definitely have to be reattached i think we'll see more under the microscope maybe these pins are even not required maybe this is just an extra ground pin or a power pin but yeah this is something we can maybe look up in a data sheet but I'm wondering if the connection is made to the surrounding uh, base here that you can see, or if it's really just the pin that would be inside. So uh, this may be very challenging, but let's see if we can revive this CPU. Okay, so we are under the microscope and Let's see how the pins look like magnified. Okay, so we definitely see some very bad pins here. Like this one here looks uh, quite bad. Nothing that seems to be unfixable for now. So these pins I should be able to straighten. But we have these few pins in the corner. And as you can see here, this is a missing pin. However, that base and the pin looks like they were machined out of one piece. There is no gap or whatsoever in there. Like they are not soldered or something like this. If I, let me find a Pentium 3. So here's a Pentium 3. 
And here I desorted already a few pins. And as you can see here, this pin is just sitting on top of a pad. If you move one of these pins too strongly, it may be that you're ripping off the pad underneath. So sometimes the entire pad comes off. And when a pad comes off, then you're losing the connection to the CPU, to the die. And this one here is, one, yeah. So yeah, I tried to play around with this one. You have uh, the copper plane right underneath. And um, if you're lucky, then you have something like this that you could reattach a pin. But sometimes, uh, oh, let's see, like here, for instance, I tried to figure out <laughs> what is supposed to be happening here. And you see that you have a plane around it. And then you have something here in the center. The chances that I will connect something that is not supposed to be connected is quite high. But I think this was not the reason why I gave up on the CPU. I don't even know what this is. Oh, it's an 850. This is an 850 100 megahertz CPU. So this one, I don't know, maybe this one would be worth saving. But here in this corner... I think um, chances are very high that this chip is dead. Uh, also here in this corner, if you can see that, the chances of reviving this CPU is very, very low. So what I need to figure out now is if I can use a pin of a Pentium 3 as a replacement on this Pentium Pro. It looks like the base is strong enough to support some solder and uh, soldered on pin. I think this one here, this one is just a ground or a power pin. I think it's a ground pin. I tried to measure them already. So these ones are all ground pins and they are all connected. The CPU most likely will work without this one. But uh, this one in this corner needs to be reattached. Luckily, those... Missing pins are all located at the outer row, so there is not anything that I need to do inside unless I'm breaking one of those pins that I'm trying to straighten. I hope this is not going to happen. Yeah, so I have a lot of other pins here now. What what I want to do is I want to hopefully well fix this uh, Pentium Pro and then try it in the board that I fixed in a previous video and see if we can execute the foof bug. So the foof bug, I made a video about this. This is just a few instructions, four to be precise, that lock up Pentium and Pentium MMX CPUs. This Pentium Pro is a predecessor of the Pentium 2 but it doesn't have MMX instructions. There are obviously a few of them that are badly bent, but I have the perfect tool, Knipex. Thank you whoever recommended this to me. I forgot and I, I don't want to look up the comment, but these pliers are absolutely amazing and they are much better than me trying to do this just with toothpicks uh, I think if you if you're not careful enough you really can break more or lift pads from the substrate here and then we have more problems to fix and we want to avoid that I guess I will show you these ones here when I'm fixing those let's do that maybe right now so here I will definitely take some toothpicks trying to get the pin into a better position that I can get in there with my pliers they are very soft, these, these pins, I feel so. <laughs> oh, and here we go. Another one that needs, yeah, but this one, eh, okay. So that's not good. Okay, yes, they are very soft, these pins. So let's try maybe to not break off more. 
I don't know, they're all loose. Even if I'm very careful. They are broken. Yeah. You see? These pins are not good. Okay. Um, I undo everything that I said before that this is going to be an easy repair. It is not. So I'm pretty sure that this pin here is also already cracked. Yes, you can see the crack here. Oh, okay, that's really not good. Oh. But we need to fix the CPU. There is absolutely no way that I'm going to scrap that CPU. Okay, so as long as they're not uh, bent at the base, I guess the pins are fine. Let me just finish all the pins that need to be straightened now. Well, this one is this one needs to be replaced. So these three in the corner we need to replace. Are there any other pins that are badly bent? Maybe these ones I can fix. Uh, probably these ones too. This one may need help. Let's try this one. They are definitely not the same pins that are used for Pentium. Pentium MMX. Did I fix this? I think this one didn't crack. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was the one right next to this one with the goo on it. <sighs> this one. No, it's loose. It is loose. I already feel the material got a lot weaker. Unfortunately, I would not have gone into this one with my pliers. There is still enough force that I need to apply. Yeah, this one is coming off. Yeah, you see the uh, broken crack here, so... Not good. Not good at all. I mean, it's nice that they're still attached a little bit. I could just try to solder them, but I should do this right now. I will never find these pins otherwise. It will be very difficult. And this is also one in a cluster of five. How big is my soldering iron versus these pins? Well, this is not too bad. I could probably resolder these ones. The crack is exactly on the other side, so... Let's try this. In the worst case, I have to just take the pin off and solder something else on there. So let's try. I definitely need flux around this one. Well, that looks beautiful. So flux, a very hot soldering iron at 350 degrees. Let's see what we can do here. I don't know if you could see that, but I think 
the solder just went beautifully around that pin. Look at that. Wow. I think this one may actually work. Okay. I have nothing to complain about this one. This one looks actually good. I'm very surprised. If all of them will be like this, I think this is good. Hey, we fixed the first pin. Now, let's see this guy here first because I need to get this one out. Oh, this is already very weak. So let's straighten this one, even though it's detached. Yeah, there it goes. This one was too weak. Yeah, I think here I need to... Yeah, okay, fine. So here I need to solder others. This one here seems to be okay. Let's do this one here. This one is okay. So let's keep these pins aside for now. This one I'm definitely trying to solder now. One more time, just let the solder nicely flow around. I will increase the light a little bit. So, let's see. Okay. And now let's see, I'll do the same thing. I'll heat the pin up and then I'll use very little solder, solder wire from the other side and try to let the solder just flow around that pin. So let's see. Heating. And now... I just want to get the solder not too high up on the pin because that part goes into the socket. So I would prefer if the solder stays at the base. There we go. Okay, how does it look? It went a little bit up on the side, but... I think this should be okay, hopefully. So here I borrowed now a pin from a Pentium 3. I wonder if it's like the same height and the same thickness. Let's see. Oh, they look actually quite good. They look like they are the same. I think we can use these. So I guess let's try to add at least some sort of base here and then we'll just try to attach these pins from the Pentium 3. So let's see if we can attach a Pentium 3 pin to a Pentium Pro. I think this is... Yeah, there is not much... Uh, of the leftovers here from that other pin. So I think we can just add a little bit of a solder blob here to build a base. Yeah, nice. And now comes the difficult part, <laughs> aligning the, the pin here without touching anything that should be golden. So let's see. How does this look? Oh. 
<laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that works much better than I expected. I guess uh, it helps that these pins are so far apart. But, well, I'm no longer afraid to add pins to that CPU. So let's just continue. Let me harvest another pin from this Pentium 3. Let's take a straight one from a corner, like this one here. And let's try to get that pin off. Let's see. There you go. Here's our pin. Very easy, no hot air. Just a soldering iron. Let's add the base again. And now let's perform the transplant. I think now I'm happy. This one definitely is a winner, the second one. But this one here, yeah. looks okay. I think it will be fine for the socket. Okay, no, I think this is okay. So unfortunately, there is another casualty here in the corner. I don't know if you can see that, but Yeah, so here the base cracked, even though the pin wasn't really in very bad shape. But the moment I pulled it up, it just decided to crack. So yeah, these pins are definitely weaker than on the Pentium and Pentium MMX CPUs. Now let's try to resolder this one as well. So let's see, same method, we'll use flux. And let's see if we can get this pin nicely reattached. It's straight, so I don't worry too much about this. So heat up the base. And let the solder flow. And that's it. So when they're still attached, it's not that bad. I can manage to get this pin reattached. And you see the solder is just at the base where I placed the soldering iron, but otherwise this pin looks good. So I think I soldered most of the other pins now and straightened the rest. I will, well, here's one missing. So this one we still have to, for this one, we still have to get a donor from the Pentium 3. And, wow, well, here's also one missing. So <laughs> the original pins that I discovered uh, were missing. They are uh, still missing. So we have two more pins. And the rest looks more or less decent now. I may have to adjust the position a little bit. Like uh, here you can see there is one that's not straightened yet. So I'll try obviously my best. I, I don't think I can uh, let this CPU drop in the socket. This is a little bit too difficult with all these pins and I don't have a socket 8 cover uh, of a broken socket that I can just uh, use as a stencil. Okay, so again, flux and add a little bit of a solder for the base.
Nice. And now comes the donor pin from the Pentium 3. And let's see. Hopefully I can manage this one. Good enough. I'll fix the orientation later on. Let's just finish the last one. I wish there wouldn't be so many pins breaking, but this definitely is not that difficult to rectify. So I'm happy about that. And we should be in business. So I think the CPU is now ready. I think I broke all corner pins. Yeah, all corner pins have been broken. So I'll clean the CPU now and then I will readjust the pins that are necessary to be readjusted and then we can try it in the socket eight board. Okay, everything is set up and we can power on the system for the very first time. I have a postcard in there that we can see in case there is nothing going on. We know that the CPU has not made it, but I'm confident. Let's see. Yes, we get postcodes. And we have a picture and a beep and we're booting MS-DOS so that CPU seems to be working okay uh, first thing I want to do let's go into the BIOS and see if it detects our Pentium Pro with one megabyte of level 2 cache oh a Pentium Pro with 256 kilobytes. That is a bit odd. Um, okay, so let's go to DOS and maybe run something like Speedsys. Okay, Intel Pentium Pro 200. Uh, caches L116 L2 1 megabyte. So this one seems to be reporting correctly. And you can see in the chart that we are dropping at the 1 megabyte level. So this is what we expect. Maybe just the board doesn't know how to report the 1 megabyte model because the manual specifically states that it only supports 256 and 512 kilobyte models. So I'm assuming that the BIOS on this board right now does not support displaying 1 megabyte of level 2 cache. On the retro web, I found now the version 18. On this board right now, there is version 12 installed. Let's see if we get more level 2 cache displayed in the BIOS if we update the BIOS. Okay, so it's written here. Uh, we just have to call the BIOS executable and specify our drive letter A, and then it should copy all the files to our floppy drive. So in A, we need the sys A. We need this. Uh, let's see. Uh, sys A, does this work? Yes, I think this is going to work. 
system transferred. So in A, we should have now our command com visible. Yes, and there is probably MS-DOS and IOSYS as well. Uh, you can always see this by having an attribute of either hidden or system files. So A and hidden. So there you go. IOSYS, MS-DOSSYS. We even have drive space bin in there. Okay. So now we just run BIOS for drive A. Uh, Self-extract utility, Intel user license. And do you want to extract the files now? Yes. And files are being copied to drive A. I flash utility. So auto exec most likely is the one that starts everything that we need for flashing the BIOS. We will have a look at this in a moment before we restart. Type auto exec. But, okay, just calls beep and I flash. Okay, so here you can see version 12 again. And now we are going to change the boot order. We will first go to our floppy drive and boot from there. So let's see how this boot process looks like. Oh, I forgot something. I forgot something very important. We have to shift a jumper. We have to change a jumper. I uh, remember in the manual, there was the jumper setting for flashing the BIOS. Okay, the jumper changed position. Let's try this again. Okay, unfortunately, it looks like there is no video output. And we have beeps. It's reading from the floppy disk, but no video output. Maybe if you would have an ISA card installed, maybe that would change. I don't want to abort the process right now because that could easily brick the board. It is still reading. Unfortunately, it's just the floppy emulator. So I have no audible feedback from the floppy drive what it's doing. Was that it? Okay, we heard a few beeps and there is nothing happening right now. I'm still not sure if I can just power off the system, switch the jumper again. Wow, this is an awful flashing process. Okay, so there is nothing else that is happening right now. I assume the flashing is complete. So let's power off and try to post the board. Okay, I changed the chompers now. Let's see what happened. I think changing the boot order in the BIOS was absolutely not necessary. Ah, yes. Yes, we have the new BIOS. 18. Now let's see if we see one megabyte displayed for level two cache in the BIOS. But first, let's change our boot order. So this was not necessary. I guess when you put the jumper into recovery mode, then the uh, board will only boot from floppy drive and do exactly what we've seen right now in this flashing process. But that's really an awful flashing process. You have no visual feedback. You have no idea what's happening. Okay, do we have one megabyte? Yes, we do. Ah, BIOS update, BIOS, BIOS, BIOS. Ah, uh, great. Now we have a one megabyte Pentium Pro 200, finally also recognized by the BIOS. And uh, yeah, I think now let's just quickly see if we get a different performance result in Speedsys. This is maybe something that's interesting. And then we'll try if the foofbug is present on this CPU. It shouldn't, but I want to test it. I think this score is almost the same, and I think this looks very similar to what we have seen before. Um, I'll probably compare these numbers before and after the flash now in the video, but I don't see any major difference here. Check CPU. This one I wanted to see. So, Jan Steunebrink, thank you for this nice tool. Intel Pentium Pro 200, 
I guess the interesting lines come at the very bottom internal L1 cache in right back mode. Then we have 16 kilobytes of level one cache and one megabyte of level two cache integrated. So let's see if we can create our foofbug F00FC7C8. And recently I also got an information that that's great, but there should be a return statement at the end in case the CPU is not affected by the foof bug. So here I can edit. Now we can enter hopefully uh, our five bytes. So we start with a regular four bytes that we all know. So F0, 0F, then we need C7, C8. And now we have a return statement, which is C3. That's it. So, and now we can save. Okay. Foof.com and no. Huh? Okay, the numlock still works. I didn't expect this to happen. Well, it's definitely not coming back. Can we do control alt delete? Oh yeah, this one worked. Uh, that definitely didn't work in the other one. So what is this like a half valid foof bug? I don't know. I have to do a little bit more research to figure that out. It is a little bit different compared to what was happening on Pentium and Pentium MMX CPUs because I still can use Control alt delete to restart the system. This wasn't possible with the other CPUs, at least the ones that I tested. If you want to know how you create this foof.com file, you can go to my website and look at the article. The codes are all written there. I will also update the post and add the new return byte that should be added at the very end of this file. But yeah, I'm curious now. Let me know what you get if you have a Pentium Pro, if yours also freezes halfway, I guess. Um, and I think I want to see what happens in Windows 98 with the system in the future, because right now I don't have Windows. <laughs> so of course I couldn't just leave it at testing the foof bug under DOS. I set up Windows 98 second edition and let's see if Windows 98 behaves differently. So as you can see, five bytes and we can also double check quickly in hue. So you see. There's our foof and the return statement. So let's see what happens when we execute foof.com. Aha, this is what we expected. So yeah, Windows 98 doesn't crash when I have a Pentium Pro. However, with a Pentium and Pentium MMX, this was a different scenario. Something that was pointed out to me is that Windows 98 has a mitigation for this bug. And you can check this very easily if you start msconfig. And here in advanced, you will see some settings that you can enable. And all the way on the bottom, enable Pentium F0, the lock instruction workaround. So this one I will definitely test one day when I have a Pentium or Pentium MMX system set up. But yes, so here you see the description. And this should prevent Windows 98 second edition to crash. I'm not sure if it's there in the first edition. Maybe if you have that version installed, you can check if you have that option to enable. But yeah, so that's it. Oh, by the way, before I go, I monitored the heat that this Pentium Pro generates and I pointed my thermal camera on the heatsink. And look at this, we are reaching around 50 degrees and this is with this big cooler on the Pentium Pro. These CPUs seem to be running quite warm, so if you have a computer case that doesn't have good ventilation, it could be that you're creating some kind of a heat problem in the entire interior of your PC. 
So, but now this is it. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, then please leave me a like, write a comment what you think about this uh, CPU, and are you happy that we were able to rescue this Pentium Pro, which clearly has very weak pins. The pins on the blacktop version seem to be a lot weaker than the ones that are used on the ceramic version. At least this is my experience. I had a ceramic Pentium Pro that I needed to straighten the pins and they were by no means that fragile. So yeah, this is maybe something to keep in mind when you go shopping for a Pentium Pro with bent pins. And I'm not sure yet if you will get a massive performance boost if you're changing from 512 kilobytes to one megabyte level two cache. But that's maybe something to figure out in a future video. So now I'm done. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give this video a like Write in the comments what you think about this project and a big shout out to all my Patreons for your invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one. Take care and bye bye.